I'm Don Holden at the Art Students League of New York. I'm in the studio where Robert Beverly Hale taught figure drawing and artistic anatomy. You're now going to see lecture number five on the shoulder girdle. going to take up the shoulder girdle. The body has two girdles, as perhaps you know. The pelvic girdle down here, which is one solid piece. And the shoulder girdle is up here. Uh, the shoulder girdle consists of the collarbones and the shoulder blade. And the best view to see the shoulder girdle is this animal view, because you can see the curl of the uh, the curve of the collarbone, you see, and you can see it moving into the shoulder blade. I think for artists they feel that a certain amount of this arm bone is part of the shoulder girdle, though that's not strict anatomy. Uh, this is without doubt the hardest part of the body to draw. Can you hear me in the back all right with this machine? This is the hardest part of the body to draw because you're, usually you have muscle layer over muscle layer, maybe sometimes three. Also, the uh, shoulder blade is very well hidden and uh, only exhibits itself by a landmark or so, yet you have to place it. And there's really no way out of that difficulty except learning to draw a shoulder blade out of your head in any position, which perhaps isn't as hard as it seems. But you really ought to work on that if you want to solve the uh, back of the body in through here. Uh, the, well, let's attack a shoulder blade. It, uh, it, uh, it has a basic plane here, which is a good deal like a piece of an eggshell. You know, we get our planes from uh, mass conception. And if you could think of an egg, it's very easy. Uh, you, could, uh, you could take a piece of that egg and uh, make a sort of a triangle out of it, you see, like that. And that would be very much like the body of the shoulder girdle. Of course, you ought to practice putting that triangle in various parts of the egg. One of the great ways to learn to draw is to take mass conceptions and draw things on them. Maybe even the letters of the alphabet. How, how would a H and H look over here versus? It would look sort of like that, wouldn't it? Because you see, Drawing is a matter of running lines over conceived forms. And uh, certainly I just conceived that egg without any trouble at all. Uh, the shoulder blade has on it uh, this thing here they call the spine. Uh, that's right under the surface, you know, the, uh, the part I'm caressing. And uh, artists get so that they can see it. Uh, its great quality is that it's a spiral plane. It starts that way and ends that way, or this one it starts this way and ends that way. Uh, that means you have to become familiar with spirals. And every artist should. The way to become familiar with spirals is to draw cylinders and 
transparent cylinders, one runs spirals around them. Uh, I mean, did practice doing this sort of thing. You see around there, around the back, or maybe you want to draw a beautiful spiral lock of hair a la Botticelli. You can do it that way. Of course, if you can shade the cylinder, you can shade the lock of hair. Uh, Botticelli, to me, was the best hairdresser in the world. I've never seen such imagination in the creation of hairdos as I have in Botticelli. A very imaginative man. Well, this uh, spine of the scapula on, uh, if we feel a uh, shoulder blade about the way I've drawn it there, it's a little more like that. Uh, the spiral is up here. It would be on a, on a cylinder running about that way, you see. And we'd feel the spine of the scapula that way, over the spiral, you see. That would give you shoulder play. Then you join it to the great triangle with a down plane. Now, of course, artists have a shade rule, which is up plane's light, down plane's dark. Uh, this is certainly a down plane here. And if I apply that rule, you see, shade will always give a little more reality to your illusion. These are all illusions, you know, old thing. Uh, I put some shade here, you see, and uh, the illusion would be a little stronger. Uh, if I don't know much about anything, if I'm a layman and just draw what I see, I'm liable to see 10, 12, 15 cast shadows down here. Uh, whether we can, get the, uh, we can get them on here a bit. Look at that one turning up here. Those, those lights up there. It all depends how many lights are in the room. So, of course, all beginners will do that, and then, of course, they'll do this, too, because they see it, you see. And uh, then people don't know where this plane meets that plane. So, you see, that's one, but only one, of the arguments as to why artists learn to tame cast shadows and uh, learn to annihilate them at a glance. You see, if I take that off, uh, I can't really get it off because the league shop has run out of chamois for almost four weeks now, it seems to me. Uh, <laughs> you see, we get our illusion back. I probably told you one of the best ways to learn to draw is to take a dollar bill out of your pocket and examine the portrait by one of the greatest of American artists, Gilbert Stewart, you see and see what he's done with the cast shadows. Uh, where is the cast shadow on the side of the nose, for instance? He has eliminated it. Where is the cast shadow on the front of George Washington's hair? He has thrown it out. How about the cast shadow under the nose? He has subordinated it greatly and run the edge over the count door line. Uh, how about the cast shadow down here? He's run the edge over all the folds of George Washington's neck piece. However, when he comes to the up plane of the coat, he let it rest and didn't put the cast shadow on it. You must get control of your cast shadows and learn to recognize them in figure drawing because they can destroy the illusion almost better than anything. Now, if anybody, anybody here got a thousand dollar bill with Sewell Chase's picture on it? I don't seem to have one. I, uh, uh, but, uh, the, uh, my, you know, it's a wonderful thing. The, the one dollar bill is by far the best. Uh, it's done by the best of the artists, you see. Uh, uh, which reminds me, of course, anybody, uh, after all, the League uh, gives you all kinds of futures, and one of them is counterfeiting. You get such an eye with a microscope for uh, fake money if you've been to the league. Uh, it's just incredible. You know, you know the fellow should have been working from dark to light. He works from light to dark. You know it's a fake. Things of that sort. Uh, in here is a, a cavity called the glenoid cavity. Uh, glenoid just means shallow. It doesn't mean anything else. 
the glenoid cavity where the ball and socket uh, joint is, that means, of course, we know there's a ball on the top of the bone, and there is. Uh, this uh, joint uh, is a ball and socket joint in there, and of course we can move the bone in any direction we wish, because that's the quality of a bone and socket joint. Uh, everybody should go over all the joints in their body and determine their character. This is ball and socket, that's why we draw it round. This is hinge, that's why we give it a square feel. <laughs> The knee is hinge. Uh, go over all your joints, see what the quality is. This is saddle. That has its own peculiar quality. We'll talk about when we come to it. Well, I suppose we might just draw a great back and put on the shoulder blades and some of the muscles and uh, maybe think of a simple proportional system. You see, we all have to have some sort of proportional system because otherwise we cannot exaggerate or subordinate because we have to exaggerate or subordinate from some sort of norm. Since there isn't any norm in the human race, we have to create the norm ourselves. And all these uh, efforts, the proportion, are usually an effort on the part of the artist to create some sort of a norm against which he can judge the model. So he has in his mind a normal secret figure, normal to him that is. One of the great rules, the art school rules, is the rule of three, from the widow's peak to the nose to the mouth. The minute you know that rule, you can look at anybody and see whether they adhere to it or whether they depart instantly. Uh, I have found, as I've told you, that uh, one of the easiest things to teach students, and I guess the simplest proportional idea in the world, is the head width, the head width because it uh, seems to repeat itself again and again. Is wash here, because that thing is going to start sinking in a moment. Uh, the head width, as you know, is the width of the head. Yes. <laughs> Not quite what it is with the skeleton, because we have a nice muscle here called temporalis that bulges it out a little. It's also called the, the five-eyed line by many artists, which seems to repeat itself all through the body. You see there is a very clear ball in the back of the head, and if you double it, you get to the pit of the neck. Uh, then, if you double the... Uh, from the pit of the neck, you get down to the bottom of the sternum on this measurement, which is the five-eyed line. Take it again, and you get to the tip of the tenth rib, which artists like to consider the bottom of the rib cage. It is, to a great many people's surprise, the width of the shoulder blade, and also the height. Uh, it is the distance between the shoulder blades at rest, not on this illy made figure which was put together by ignorant mechanics but on the normal person at rest this is the width here uh, uh, two of them this is a little too long uh, two of them will make an arm you see uh, three of them will make the lower leg three more will hit the ground uh, this thing turns up so often I think there's something almost uh, mystic about it uh, of course, you can make spheres with the five-eyed diameter. You could make uh, cubes whose sides are five eyes and uh, solve a great many problems of draft draft draftsmanship thereby. So we can start off drawing the back of the body by drawing the, uh, the ball at the back of the head. <laughs> And we could be pretty convinced that it was five eyes across. I guess too big.
You see, if you wanted, you put it in a cube. And then you could double the cube, but even though you're drawing the back, you know the pit of the neck is there. Uh, we've studied the back a bit. As you uh, rise up the neck, your first important landmark is the dorsal spine of the seventh cervical vertebra. This bump here, which everybody can feel on the back of the neck if they wish, or see on the model. Uh, I think I've tried to make it clear that uh, landmarks, uh, the best ones of course are a bony because they're so much more consistent. The flesh, as we all know, is very inconsistent. But skeletons and bones are very consistent, I suppose, because it's an engineering matter and we're designed to perform human tasks, so we're all very much the same. Uh, when we get here, we can double this and get to the bottom of the rib cage. Uh, we can take that again and we hit a landmark which is not bony, but the convenience is such we take it, it is the bottom of the buttocks. Now, the rib cage can be thought of as being in four or five-eyed squares. Uh, how is that? Four or five-eyed squares. Uh, and the pelvis on a woman can be thought to be the same. Now, in drawing, we have to have a terminology. We have to have words, <coughs> and we take them from the doctors. The doctors love to imagine a human figure just like this, as I've told you. And they get all their words from this. You see, this is the front, this is the back, this is the front of the hand, this is the back of the hand. Uh, this is the top of the head, but this is the top of the foot here, you see. And it doesn't matter what position the object is in, we, uh, the doctors use those terms. They use them constantly because they're always cutting up corpses on tables, don't you see? And they have to have precise terms. And the head is probably horizontal on the table, but they'll say the height of this head is so much, that's from here to there, you know? And the width is so much, and the depth is so much. Uh, artists, of course, are using height lines, width lines, and depth lines all the time. Just about half of draftsmanship is taking a ride on a height line, a width line, or a depth line. And those height, width, and depth lines are drawn from the doctor's anatomical position. Uh, <coughs> well, we're drawing the back now. I think you can see that uh, the first rib comes around from the back and goes to the vicinity of the pit of the neck under the collarbone to be sure. And the two first ribs make a kind of a circle. And it's through that circle that we breathe and swallow. So we have to bring the neck out of that circle, you see. Don't bring the neck out of here, but bring it out of the circle of the first ribs. Uh, for the artist, that becomes a constructional circle, which he takes from the seventh cervical dorsal spine and sweeps around to the pit of the neck. Uh, you notice that it's not the five eyes, it's less, maybe about four. Pit of the neck's in front there. Uh, can you see through and see the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, sternum bone here? Uh, because artists have to have see-through eyes, x-ray eyes. Can you see the ensiform cartilage on the bottom? You remember what we used it for? To find the extreme width of the rib cage on the back and front views. Uh, that makes it reasonably easy to draw a rib cage because we know where it's widest. You see on the level of the ensiform. We've been all through this, so I'd go more slowly. Do you remember how we put a pelvis in a block here? We took one third of that line, put the back triangle there. Can you see through and see the front triangle? Because for an artist, the pelvis is simply the front and back triangle. 
connected by the pelvic crest to a great extent. Uh, do you remember the line of the angle of the ribs? It very much follows the outline, you know. Uh, <coughs> Uh, we can continue, can continue it if we wish in our minds right down to the triangle of the sacrum. Uh, we can continue it up here to the cervical line up there if we wish. We get a line all the way down the body which tells us the width of the strong cords that run up and down all the way from the sacrum to the top of the head. See, through here they hold the rib cage erect, and through here they hold the, neck, the head erect. So that those cords are very human things. Now, the shoulder blades, uh, we could uh, let them rest against the line of the angle of the ribs. And they, they do normally. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, spine of the scapula, which has that little spiral feel, would be there. And uh, the shoulder blade would be underneath. And uh, there's one on the other side. Notice the little downhill quality of the end of the spine, which, of course, in the artist's mind is a great landmark. Uh, that's the point of the shoulder, so called, by artists. Uh, look at me use a width line to catch the, uh, uh, the other one here. Uh, of course, if you wanted to study a shoulder blade, you could put it in a block and memorize points to the shoulder blade in relation to the block, just the way we're memorizing the rib cage here. Then you could throw the block in any crazy position you wanted, and the shoulder blade would follow that position. Uh, <coughs> Well, there's the shoulder blade. Now, one thing about the shoulder blade, it moves all over this rib cage. It's terribly movable. Uh, and uh, whenever the model takes a pose, the artist looks to see where the shoulder blade is. Uh, there are several hints, as I said. But, of course, <coughs> it wouldn't be movable unless there was something to move it. Uh, you know, the shoulder blade has to move around the body that way. Uh, in a way, the artist thinks the shoulder blade and the arm is one, you know. If I put my arm out that way, the action is partly promoted by the shoulder blade moving around the body. Uh, that is done by a muscle we call the great serratus, which really means the great sawtooth muscle. And in the beginning, people think these bumps are ribs here, you see. Uh, but they're not at all. They are the serratus muscle. And uh, it, uh, it originates, for the artist really, from the inferior angle here of the shoulder blade on the inside where my finger is. And fingers and muscles sweep out to individual ribs, you see. From the ninth to the, from the fifth to the ninth, as I remember. Uh, it's all like fingers around the body. And uh, the first one is horizontal, and then they begin to go downhill. Ought to be five of them, I guess. Let me see, five, six, seven, eight, nine, yeah. And their whole idea in life is to pull the shoulder blade around. Uh, of course, they're enormously developed in prize fighters. Because, you see, they help him deliver a blow. And one can learn a good deal about the back by looking at the television, watching these great gorillas attack each other, and uh, especially since there really isn't so much action in the prize fight. Most of the time, the gorillas are hugging each other, you see, so they can't hit each other. And the artists can study the back with great care on the television. Or you could pay $45 and go to the fight if you wish, but uh, you can see everything on the screen. All these muscles we're going to talk about, beautifully developed, beautifully. Uh, I think we ought to draw a side view here, and the side view uh, would be nothing but the, uh, uh, but, but uh, six boxes, really, 
Let's see if we can get a little proportion here. Oh, it's so far apart. Uh, uh, not like that. See, if we put the ball of the back of the head in there, uh, then we can hang the egg in front, as they say. See, that's the mass conception of the head that the artist has used for generations. <coughs> the ball and the egg. It's great for general shape. It's not so hot for position and aspect. Because if I draw a ball, can anybody tell how much it's rotated? Can anybody tell how much it's tilted, you know? The only thing that gives you perfect position and aspect is the block, you see. And that's why artists in their minds, and in the beginning actually, throw things into blocks all the time. Because they have to nail down the position and the aspect of each form. Uh, the rib cage, if you remember, would come down to the... here. And we talked about it a lot. Here's the first ribs. Uh, there is the manubrium and the gladiolus, the ansiform. Uh, it would touch there. And come about to the halfway point here. Uh, one thing beginners should note very carefully in this profile pose is that the ribcage keeps going out. Uh, beginners have an absolutely insatiable desire to put a concave there and cut all of that off. Uh, you can get over it if you throw rib cages, skeletal rib cages, into the nudes you draw in class. <coughs> Quite often. <coughs> the uh, pelvic crest, we talked a lot about that some time back, and we decided we could just get a few points. Uh, we could draw beautiful pelvises. Here's the sacrum. Here's the secondary point. And uh, symphysis pubis. Here's a great construction line. Uh, a height line from the high point of the pelvic crest to about an eye above the bottom of the block. You see, this is the pelvic block, the perspective and proportional block it really is. And uh, so it's not very hard to finish up a pelvis now. Uh, uh, the, uh, is another famous construction line among artists. From the wide point to the Ischium, because of this acetabulum or hole for the leg bone, the back lip will hit that, you see. Oh, when this comes around, plays around like that. Well, oh, we got a pelvis good enough for anyone. Uh, the shoulder blade, of course, is up here. Uh, students have a hard time drawing it because this collarbone is coming at them at a great rate. Uh, I think the thing to do is remember that the, collar, the collarbone is a, a sort of an S-shaped rubber hose. And then always try to draw it as if you're a little above it, a little below it, to keep the uh, S-shaped feeling. And so I could bring it out of here. <coughs> Maybe pretending I'm a little above it, I could attach it to the uh, spine of the scapula and raise a uh, shoulder blade, you see. Uh, here's the glenoid cavity on the profile. The shoulder blade has a tendency to look up that way on the figure at rest. Now, these serratus muscles run, as I say, from the fifth. And uh, they hit a spiral here that uh, authorities always like to say comes from the nipple. Which I suppose on a man, a man's nipple, uh, be about there. Uh, they come way out and hit that spiral. They go to the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth. Uh, 
And notice that they all originate from that point. Now, there were others up here that we don't use as artists. That's the great anterior serratus. And I think you could well see its function there, those uh, fingers of muscle that attach to the individual ribs want to pull the fore shoulder blade forward and assist in the delivering of a blow. Uh, there's an awful lot of drawing theory connected with those darn things. Uh, of course, you draw them differently according to the position of the rib cage, you see. Uh, we, we could find out a lot about position and direction and aspect. You see, a rib cage is really an egg in field. But the trouble with an egg is, about all I know is it's going that way. Uh, I don't know that it's going this way or that way unless I tell the people. And so what artists do is, in their mind, encase it in a cylinder. You see, in the minute they do that, cylinders being marvelous for tilt, then they know that that egg is tipped that way, but the egg itself won't tell them. And if they think that, then of course this first line here, instead of being horizontal, uh, would, uh, would have that quality, you see, because that's go around the egg, and all the other ones would follow suit. So you have to know where things are before you can draw a line over them, you see. That's the fundamental rule of draftsmanship. You have to know their aspect or position. Uh, and since all lines supposedly go over conceived form, you always know where the form is when you draw it. It's terribly important on the mouth, because the center line of the mouth goes around the cylinder of the teeth. And whenever the head moves, that cylinder moves, so the center line of the mouth becomes very different. Every time the head moves an eighth of an inch, you can't see it. Like so many things in drawing, it's intellectual. Well, that's the serratus, and I think you can see what it does. Uh, now, you have to pull the shoulder blade back towards the center line. Uh, that's done by a group called the rhomboids. Uh, and the rhomboids, let's get a center line here. Uh, the rhomboids are this sort of a muscle here, like that. Uh, the doctors have two, but the artists only take one. And they call it the rhomboid group. Uh, doctors have an upper one and a lower one. The fibers run that way. Uh, I probably told you that artists study the direction of fibers to a certain extent for various reasons. Uh, one of them is that wrinkles like to form and at right angles to the fibers, you see. Uh, another one might be that, you know, shading is quite a hard thing in line. You never quite know which way to run these lines. It's such a subtle business. But occasionally, when you're lost for any ideas at all, just you follow the fibers of the muscle. It's quite good on the muscle that I am now stroking, the external oblique or oblicus externus. Often works. But frequently, you can use the direction of fibers for the shade line. Uh, of course, there's one on the other side, I would imagine. That's called the rhomboid. You can well imagine that if the shoulder blade gets pulled way over to the center line, this thing bulges up a lot. It's called the rhomboid bulge. <clears throat> I think the way to think of it is a big flat piece of rubber there, rather thick uh, piece of rubber in the shape of a rhomboid. If the shoulder blade gets pulled way around to the front, its influence almost disappears. And you can see the line of the angle of the ribs quite clearly in almost every model. There's a muscle that they don't often tell art students about, but Bridgman makes a good deal of it in his book. It's called the lifter of the angle of the scapula. It comes off the first four uh, transverse there, and it makes a great uh, sort of big rope of muscle that goes into this angle here. It come out quite as far as that, doesn't it? Uh, in four pieces. Uh, but in the Bridgman books, on all these poses here that you see, he loves to bring that out, though it's pretty hard to see its uh, effect. 
Now, I think you know that these strong cords here, which are under the rhomboids, uh, are made up of quite a number of muscles that you can study in your books if you wish, but I believe you fall back on the function rule unless you're terribly uh, pertinacious. The function rule being that if two or more muscles <coughs> have approximately the same function, the, art, the artist groups them together. Now, the function of all these muscles in here primarily is to hold that head erect, you see. And so artists invariably think deep there of two strong ropes, one on each side of the center line. And uh, it is true that if you put them there, you get quite a human quality. Uh, some of you who are ambitious uh, might study this bandage muscle here uh, that covers them, though it's uh, much more important than, and, uh, than uh, in animals. Uh, but the really important one in humans is this great uh, trapezius here. Uh, this thing here that goes down to the shoulder blades and has a beautiful tail on the bottom. It, uh, it arises from this curved line, the cervical curved line there. And one way artists get it on the, on the rested figure is just to draw a rhythm line from shoulder point to shoulder point. And they bring the muscle down and they lay it on the rhythm, you see. It covers everything. Uh, and uh, it has little details that artists know. The, the seventh cervical shows through it always as a bump there. And uh, surrounding it is a line, sort of a depressed lozenge, which of course is the line of the insertion of the fibers. <coughs> then the trapezius had a beautiful tail. Uh, that uh, normally goes to the twelfth, which is here. The twelfth dorsal spine, though frequently, maybe eight cases out of ten it goes there. You'll notice that uh, Mr. Hudon had it wrong. But then he made that when he was 23 years old, and uh, they didn't know much about medicine in those days, as far as statistics go. And I'm really not so sure how close artists and statistics should be, you know. Uh, the tail of the trapezius uh, starts here, and artists love this line because they can carry it over the forms underneath, you see. It goes over the shoulder blade, and then it goes over the rhomboid, and then it goes over the other muscle we're going to talk about, and about its line, over its line of insertion. And it goes to its origin down here. There is, of course, one on the other side. Uh, but the great advantage of that tail, usually, because it's never so terribly visible, is to use the edge line to tell all you know about what goes on underneath, you see. Uh, <coughs> it covers up the rhomboids, of course. Uh, due to the insertion of the fibers right about here, it causes a dimple there, which is very important to artists. You'll always see a little dimple here, and you can always see the point of the shoulder blade. <coughs> well, if you can see those two, you'll know about the spine of the shoulder blade, and then you'll know where the shoulder blade is, which is always a hard thing to find out. <coughs> A little dimple here, you see. Uh, oh, because it's just a ponderosis and the, uh, the uh, insertion of the fibers starts. Uh, actually, uh, this trapezius, like the rhomboids out, uh, underneath it, uh, the insertion of the fibers is a little on the outside of the center line. Uh, you see, they're coming down like this. And it differs in different people. And that's why the, uh, the, uh, line of the center of the back is often a hollow because the insertion of the fibers are just a little ways out, you see. Uh, we'll run in anatomy quite often to the line of the insertion of the fibers. And artists are quite uh, are conscious of that particular kind of line. 
But the thing is, it differs in different models. Now, uh, <clears throat> we've talked about these things here a bit, but they run, as you can see, from the sacrum, that's the sacrum, to the rib cage, two big ropes, one on each side is the way the artist thinks of them. And uh, frankly, they're made up of three muscles. Uh, again, if you look closely, you'll see a line like this. And it is the beginning of this muscle that sends uh, processes up to the angles of the ribs. It's called iliocostalis. It's the line of the insertion of the fibers. Then there's another one. Uh, there's another one, I can't even remember the name. Then there's another one called spinalis dorsi. But very often you'll see an upside down triangle uh, reflecting this one. And it's made by the insertion of the fibers in the great back muscles, you see. Uh, this is usually all aponeurosis and covers, and thick aponeurosis too, and it covers the sacrum and kills the details. Uh, most of your new students will draw this triangle rather than that one, but that's a great mistake. <coughs> because there is no greater betrayal of the position of the pelvis than the front and the back triangle. And it's something we really ought to tell the people, you know, when we draw a figure. The position of the pelvis. You see, really drawing this torso from the top of the head to the bottom of the pelvis is a matter of telling them the position of each one of these great skeletal forms. Uh, you have to be more than a beginner to realize that that position is made up by you, the artist, you see. The beginner just thinks he can copy, of course. But, the minute you begin to think things over, you realize you can't. And I've probably told you why 20 times. You see, the model will take his fine, fresh pose at the beginning, something like this. And then it's hard to be a model, and time passes, and the head turns to the front, and the shoulders become uh, horizontal. And the weight goes on the other foot, and by the end of the hour, she's about like this. So all the copiers, which of course is the uh, beginner, uh, have a kind of a vitality up here and a great fatigue down there, you <laughs> see, in one picture. And that, of course, is a breach of unity, which is a terrible thing for an artist to do. We create, of course, the direction of our forms for our expressive intent. Take a look at that Degas show up there. If anybody here wants to be an artist, of course, ought to run right up to the Metropolitan Museum and look at the Degas show because there's the greatest draftsman of the 19th century. And it's a great thing for us to look at great draftsmen with a questioning eye. Perhaps you can formulate questions and Degas will give you the answers. That's the great thing about uh, first-rate drawing is that it'll provide answers to almost anything. Well, I guess we ought to have a little recess now. We'll come back, we'll do the front of the shoulder girdle and move on a bit. Fibers. Uh, but the strange thing is that all a fiber could do is contract completely so that uh, if we want to lift our arm with just a little power, only seven or eight of the muscle fibers will do it, you see. I mean, if you want to pick up a feather, the boss of the muscles up here says, uh, you know, sends orders to about three fibers and they pick up the feather. But if you decide you're going to pick up the grand piano, the boss up here says, all right, boys, all together. <laughs> and they all go to work, you see, you pick up the grand piano. I think it's one of the most mysterious things about the body, that uh, these messages all come from the firing of neurons back here. They're all so beautifully regulated and ordered by some sort of an entity that is certainly subservient to our will in many ways. Well, to move on to the front of the figure, 
Uh, we can create a front just the way we create a back. I, I would think for an artist, the back and the front are almost precisely the same because he sees through, you see, he sees through. And uh, we can uh, uh, feel that ball in the back and find out where the shoulders were and all those things. The ball must be about like that. Uh, this is the front of the figure, you see. Uh, the face would now be the egg in front. A little narrower, you know, than the ball. Uh, center line is always valuable in drawing. Bit of the neck would be here. You see, it's there. About there. And then we get this big uh, block of the rib cage, which is uh, simply four five-eyed cubes. Uh, <coughs> probably about like that. Uh, and uh, in that, we can easily throw a rib cage by feeling that nice constructional circle of the first ribs, uh, which is that sort of a feeling you see coming to the pit of the neck. And all these things we talked about, the manubrium. There's an important line. It lives on the front plane of this uh, four cube box. That's the line of the angle of the sternum. You see, it's a line like this. <coughs> the uh, gladiolus comes down and bulges a little. And it has on the bottom the ensiform cartilage. And artists study that ensiform cartilage because it's on the bottom of that, the horizontal plane on the bottom that shows you where the rib cage will be widest on the front and back view. So it's quite easy for me to draw a rib cage because I know where it'll be widest. Uh, I uh, wouldn't quite know how wide it would be altogether because they vary. And uh, so you just do the best you can. That's a pretty narrow one, I think. Now, then we can use the same box for the pelvis. And pretty soon we can throw these boxes in any direction we want with just a slight amount of practice. And if we know where the landmarks are, why so much the better. You remember some of the landmarks? The most important in the body, perhaps, is that. Those are the pelvic points. <coughs> Here's the wide point of the pelvis. Uh, the high point we can... Uh, say is in the physical center of that block. Um, so we can get a pelvic crest now without much trouble. Pretty much like that, you see. You see curves in perspective. There's no way to catch them except to get points on them. The uh, symphysis pubis, halfway down here, the point is there. And we get a front triangle, you see in terms of points. Uh, in terms of actuality, the, the front point is very big and the symphysis pubis is about so big. Uh, but points are just positional hints. They don't exist. They have no dimension. Uh, lines don't exist. They only have length. These things I'm drawing are not lines, you know. They're big three-dimensional pileups of charcoal, but they give the observer the mental concept of a line. That's the fascinating thing. This thing is also mental. And of course, planes don't exist either. And as I said last time, we look at the front of the model and all we see are planes. And we only see the total front planes of the model. We have no idea what's going on in the back except from experience. I mean, there might be a whole... Uh, Rhode Island clam bake going on in the back. Uh, how do we know? We don't know unless we walk around and look. Uh, uh, so we've got a little pelvis here. Uh, but we're not going to use much of it. Now, about the front of the uh, shoulder girdle. The collarbones. Uh, as I said, uh, almost all beginners will draw them straight, which is a great mistake. Uh, 
because the straight line gives the illusion of flat form. And if they look straight, just raise your head an eighth of an inch or drop it and you'll get the S-curve back, which will carry the form. So if I draw a collarbone here, I'll uh, pretend I'm just a touch above it and, and get the little feel of an S-curve anyway. Uh, they start off rather round and end up rather flat. And uh, I suppose I should say uh, that the only bone-to-bone -bone articulation of the shoulder blade is right here. You see, that collarbone can move up and down and out and in. Uh, you better test it on yourself to see just how much, but a great eel. And when it does that, it drags the shoulder blade with it. The shoulder blade has no bony connection with the rib cage at all. It's been riveted here by the Texans who made this, but uh, it's very movable, you see. And one of our great problems, as I suggested, is to place that down shoulder blade when we do it back. Uh, well, uh, we have to do this, you know, uh, like the birds. Maybe I ought to tell you about birds. <laughs> well, I tell you a little about. We have a little time. Uh, birds are animals. And uh, they have the animal, uh, the animal uh, backbone and feel, you see. I mean, they have an S-shaped neck. They have a C-shaped backbone. And their rib cage hangs from the backbone, just like animals. They have a great keel here, you see. They have shoulder blades, rather vestigial. They have a uh, humerus. Radius and ulna, and even a little hand with a quite pronounced thumb. And the feathers, as you know, come off the, uh, the arm. Now, their collarbone grows from one shoulder blade to the other. But they call it their wishbone, you see, because these collarbones join together. <coughs> but what I wanted to bring out was that this pectoralis muscle we're about to study. <coughs> This pectoralis muscle here, of course, is very powerful on birds because it pulls their wings down when they fly. And uh, so all this great big muscle here is pectoralis on the bird. And it's the white meat, you know, you eat on the turkey. Uh, so they have this great power to bring their wings down and and the very intelligent animals they are, they're like the rich. They spend the summers in the north and the winters in the south. <laughs> I had an incredible uh, experience when I was imprisoned at the Metropolitan Museum. You know, I was. I was a man, I suffered, I was there for 18 years. And <laughs> so I had lots of experiences, and one of the experiences was to go to Southampton, Long Island, where the rich lived. And I went to the beach club, and there were all these men who were married to rich women. They weren't very happy, but they were sitting at the beach club all day, you know, <laughs> drinking their mart martinis. And there were quite a number of birds there I recognized. <laughs> they'd eat little crumbs and they'd eat little canapes. And then uh, that winter, the Met set me down to a place called Hobe Sound, where there were even richer people. And I met all the same men and all the same birds, you see. <laughs> because these birds are so bright that they, uh, they know how to take care of themselves. <laughs> and they do it largely with the pectoralis muscle. Uh, th that might make you think of angels. Uh, angels have to have shoulder blades for their arms. And they would have to have shoulder blades for their wings. And they would, if they did, you know, have to have a keel. But we have to remember that angels are uh, immaterial conceptions. They're mental conceptions, like lines and points. Uh, I used to draw angels, but uh, certain people disapprove, so uh, I don't draw any more angels uh, the way they would be mechanically. Uh, <laughs> well, we might look at the bird's pelvis, which is a lot like ours, and uh, examine his, you see, his little uh, femur there. Uh, then he has a tibia and fibula, and then he has a foot down here with the... Uh, tarsal bones, and 
varying numbers of metatarsals, varying uh, toes, but usually a thumb in the back that will hold him on the perch, you see. Uh, anybody wants to draw birds, why just go up to the Museum of Natural History and get one of those little books on how to draw birds. Uh, maybe an anatomy book, you can draw them easily. Uh, the, the, uh, you have to study the feather tracks a great deal. Uh, the way if you draw animals, you have to study the hair tracks. Even if you draw beards these days, you have to study the hair tracks to draw a good beard. Well, uh, this is a front view. And uh, we have to think about the pectoralis. If we look at this uh, shoulder blade, <coughs> we'll see this glenoid cavity, which I really haven't drawn yet. And uh, it's very wise to be able to look through the body and see it there, because it has a couple of points on it that we drive lines to. Now, protecting the glenoid cavity is this curious little thing called the coracoid process. It's like a little bent finger. And that sticks out in front. That has landmarks on it, too. And artists are able to see through and see that because there's nothing harder to draw than the upraised arm. And unless you know where to drive your lines, which are mostly on the glenoid cavity and the coracoid, uh, it's quite hard to draw an upraised arm. Oh, I, I put it too far in. I forgot the uh, points of the shoulder. Glenoid cavity. In other words, we see through the front, we see the shoulder blade in the back. We always see that shoulder blade. Uh, <coughs> well, supposing we couldn't, how would we know where these things started? You see, that's the famous point there, the inferior angle of the... Of the shoulder blade and every one of those serratus, the lower ones, come right off it. Uh, well, I suppose we might put an arm bone in there. We won't talk too much about it, but it is, of course, a ball. And it has sort of a bump on it, and it comes down about as long as the shoulder blade. Now, uh, if I put in the fifth rib, comes to the halfway point. Uh, frankly, there are two pectoralis muscles here. Uh, the great one, pectoralis major, and the little one, pectoralis minor. And pectoralis minor draws underneath. And what it does is to send three processes up from the fifth, fourth, and third rib uh, to the coracoid. I mean, little processes like this. Coracoid. Uh, uh, they come from the uh, from the ribs. <coughs> Three of them. That's pectoralis minor. Now, <coughs> the great, uh, for an artist, uh, pectoralis minor has a sort of a special uh, feel. Uh, you notice how flat a man is in front here, good developed man, or even a good developed woman. And uh, yet the rib cage is highly curved and highly uh, conical there. Uh, what the artists think of pectoralis minor is that it makes a kind of a shelf on each side over which the great pectoralis goes. And that flattens out the feeling of the great pectoralis. Uh, its function isn't much. It uh, could depress the shoulder blade. But since people are usually upright, it doesn't even have to do that. Gravity does it, you see. And believe me, your muscles aren't going to do anything that gravity will do. They're terribly aware of gravity, and they, they just if they don't have to do anything, they're not going to do anything. They sit around like transit workers in a car barn, and they don't do anything. <laughs> I unfortunately made that statement in class one day, and a great big character came up to me and said, Mr. Hale, I resent that remark. I am a transit worker, <laughs> and you don't understand what goes on in car barns. <laughs> he said, if the express has to go out, has, the engineer has to take it, and if he's not there, he has to have a substitute. 
And what else can the substitute do but sit around? So, uh, so maybe it's not a very fair uh, analogy, you know. Uh, but nevertheless, the uh, preservation of energy is very strong in this body of ours, and we're not going to do unconsciously any extra work. Now, over the small pectoralis grows the pectoralis major. It has one uh, utterly independent piece that comes off the collarbone uh, that you can see on the model, and it almost looks like a separate muscle on each side, of course. Uh, <coughs> then there are a, a various number of pieces, uh, four, sometimes three, sometimes five, each one going in underneath the one uh, below. And that's what makes that curve of the front armpit, you see. And of course, they go over pectoralis minor. Uh, there's a piece too about here. I've uh, got a bone in here. The, uh, that's the lonesome piece. Oh, it's, uh, I'm thinking of something else. That's the lonesome piece. It doesn't seem to be attached to the rib cage. It isn't, as a matter of fact, attached to the collarbone. Uh, but the other ones are attached to the sternum here, and uh, each one goes in under the other, and they cause that curve in the front of the armpit. And now, of course, these lines are hardly seen, perhaps in very strong men, uh, and uh, beginners should be very careful with them. <clears throat> because under terms of light, this is an up plane usually, you know, and should be treated very lightly. Uh, one thing beginners do is to see an occasional fiber here casting a shadow, or put a big black mark on the uh, <laughs> up plane of the pectoralis, but uh, it hurts the illusion. Uh, now, the artist thinks perhaps this way. You know, we think differently for different situations. The artist would think, well, here's a head. <coughs> Three-fourths, perhaps. Here's the neck. Uh, here's a rib cage on the three-fourths. <coughs> here's the center line which artists love to use because it stills the rotation of the rib cage, you see, and you have to know just how much a form is rotated, or you have to state it. You create it, actually. You create the rotation in the tilt, you know. Uh, I guess we might put in a, uh, a pelvis here someplace. All we need is a couple of triangles. <coughs> you see, there's the synthesis. Here's the uh, wide point, there's the high point. If you can get the front triangle, it's awfully wise just for practice to put in the back triangle. It's about that, if you follow me. And the pelvic crest moves around. <coughs> Something like that. And we begin to get a little pelvis. Uh, now, artists often think of the rib cage as egg-like, of course. They're fascinated by a line that runs down here and is very strong there because when it comes to lighting things in two major light planes, that is one of the few anatomical plane breaks on the body for major light. You see, artists know that they get a better illusion if they use two lights. Uh, the reason for that is terribly deep. Uh, you see, when this Earth started three billion years ago, the sun came up in the morning, just the way it does now, and the moon came up in light. And when the first globule of life appeared, about 
I don't know. Well, I guess the globule appeared about uh, three billion years ago, didn't it? Uh, so the Earth started a little earlier, four billion. Uh, that was lit by the sun and the reflected light. And at night, it was lit by the moon and the reflected light of the moon, you see. So all through these years, the subconscious of living uh, organisms got used to seeing things in two lights. And therefore, if you want to create a first-rate illusion, if you create it in two lights, it'll look better than if it was created in three or more. And that's one of the reasons that an artist has to learn to create light. That's why an artist is very creative, like the Lord Almighty, he can create light, you know. That is, a trained artist can. Uh, now, very often, just because of the writing demands, and perhaps for a few other reasons, one might think of the pectoralis as a kind of a, of a curved paving block there, you see. Uh, that would readily accept light. If we throw a light from there, of course, we can feel the shade over here, you see, like that. And we can keep our shade moving, as some of you know, and model in the shade. Uh, the rib cage has a front and side now. And so we could, we could shade the side of the rib cage. That line's too far over, you see. And we begin to get a certain, uh, a certain feeling of mass. Uh, you'll notice we do it by contrast. The contrast between that dark there and that light there. <coughs> Uh, in uh, traditional drawings, artists reserve their contrast for the meeting of major light planes. Uh, beginners and laymen, of course, will make contrast for what they feel is psychologically important or what's important to them. Uh, that's why they make great black nipples, big black navels, you see, and uh, great black crotches, pelvic hairs, I mean. It's because they think sex is terribly important. So they make these things very black so that everybody will see them because they're so important. Well, they are important. God knows. Where would we be, any of us? But the artists think mass is important. So they use their contrast to bring out the mass, you see. Uh, now, if this is a woman, a woman will, in all probability, have a breast. Uh, you know. If we've lit this with this light, we could light the breast with the same light and we could produce the illusion of a sphere, you see. Uh, what is strange is an artist can break everything into two planes. You see, I've broken that uh, pectoralis into two planes. I can break the sphere into two planes. And of course, the analysis is that the front plane is that plane lit by the direct light that the artist has invented. And the side plane down here is, in, is lit by the reflected light. And this, of course, is the plain meeting in the darkest place of all. Uh, that's straight academic, academic law, you know, L-O-R-E. Well, I can pick that up and put it on there. Uh, the rule is that a good breast is one-third the height of the rib cage. It would be about this. Uh, students really ought to draw that center line and never place the breast until they've drawn the center line. So that uh, the uh, breasts will be well placed. And of course, I would shade that with the same light that I would shade a sphere. So if you want to learn about academic shade, all you have to do is learn how to shade mass conceptions, you see. Uh, take this to the man in the street and say, what have I got there? He'll say a sphere. It's instinctive to him. Now, what happens if I put on another breast over here? And uh, I throw a straw, well, I might just throw a light from the top. I might draw what I see, I'll see this. You see, artists don't feel that looks so hot. And the illusion isn't very good, you see, for the spherical shape. Or it might be that uh, I threw a light, or there was a light coming from there and one from there, and I'd get uh, this. You see, beginners draw what they see. And that doesn't look so much like a breast, because we always think of shape. 
looks a little more like the symbol of yin and yang, something like that. Uh, so the artist is very liable to give the illusion of the breast lit with two lights because it makes a more uh, proper illusion. Now, there's a great thing in drawing, and that is that all lines, in their intensity, follow the shade that is on the form. You see, the line is dark there. It almost invariably dies in the highlight. It picks up and gets very dark in the darks and gray in the grays. That's the reason we don't make a big black nipple. The nipple sits back about here. It has a, a ring around it. The ring might be dark there, you see. And uh, I can't get my lights here because the, uh, the uh, stores run out of chamois, but I want to tell you about nipples on women. Uh, they look out this way. See, beginners always put them right at the center on the front view, but they're on the side, you know. They look out this way, you see. And uh, you have to think, if I were a woman and was standing here, that this breast would be looking at maybe Jersey, Jersey City, I guess. <laughs> and this one at Staten Island. That's the way they go. They're not right at the center. The way beginners put them. <laughs> well, to get in a little into the theory of drawing, uh, uh, what we do, of course, is work in mass conception. Oh, I suppose I better start right in the whole, at the beginning of the whole thing. We work in terms of points. But the point doesn't exist, you know. Look at that under the microscope, as I've said. It's a big buildup of charcoal. It has three dimensions. We work in terms of lines. But lines don't exist either. Because they only have lengths. And to exist in this material world, we have to have three dimensions. We put lines around white spaces and we get planes. But they don't exist either. Of course, they're illusions. They create illusions. It's with the planes that we create illusions of volume. You see, I can take three planes and create the illusion of a block. Or I can take a great circular plane and create the illusion of a cylinder. Or a thing like that, I create the illusion of the egg. Now, it's from these that we get the manifold planes that we use when we draw the body. You see, if I take a piece of this egg off here, an eggshell about like that, uh, I get what the artist calls the convex, convex plane, you see. If I take a little plane here, I get two planes brutally meeting, which happens occasionally in the body, like here, or here. But remember, we use lines to show the meetings of planes, you see. Uh, very few artists know that the outline is nothing but the meeting of the front, the total massive front plane you see, and the total massive back plane you don't see. That's what, what an outline is, is technically. Uh, Here's a terribly common plane, which is this one. You see, or perhaps I could take it over here. Uh, <coughs> there are other mass conceptions, such as donuts, which are terribly good, and spools. Uh, you see, the thing is that if I took this plane in here, I would have a concave, convex plane. We get those very occasionally on the body. Uh, I often think these cords are that way and the uh, Achilles tendon. Uh, what I'm trying to bring out is that those things are the words of the visual language. If you can shade those forms, you can see how you can shade your plane. You see, I can shade this cylinder in two decent lights. Uh, I, I would say I could almost do it instinctively. Uh, an artist, all artists can who are trained. Uh, so that any plane I take off of there, say this one, uh, I'd know how to shade it if I took it out here. You see, it would be a light to dark. And it would express itself. 
Uh, most of the planes in the body do seem to come off the egg. Uh, they are convex, convex planes. Uh, you see, they're things like that. Uh, they're convex that way and convex that way to the outside. Uh, if we were really uh, finishing up this girl here, uh, you know, she has rectus abdominis here. She'd have one of those right there. Uh, if I could shade this, and indeed I can, uh, I'd feel a little dark moving up to the highlight there. And that's what I put on that, you see. So you can transplant these planes to your body if you wish. So what I've uh, also we have to think of planes on the interior of these things. They don't occur on the human body very much, or even in growing things. Uh, you see, that's concave that way, or it's straight that way. Let's get on the inside of the egg. We'll get one that's concave both ways. You know, right on the inside of that egg. It's concave that way, concave that way. Uh, those planes don't turn up much in the body. The only one I can think of is this one here in young people, the philtrum. They will, however, turn up all the time on the skeleton, but only where the skeleton is covered with flesh. Uh, as I've intimated, we come from the sea and we don't want any co extra concavities around that might have slowed us up in the water. But I think what I'm trying to point out that these things here are perhaps the basic words of the visual language. Uh, they're a good deal like the words that the poets use, you know. <coughs> and of course, to see what the poets think of it, which is awfully close to the way we think of it, and there's no one better than T.S. Eliot. And if I can have a little drink of water, I might tell you what he said. <laughs> he was describing the use of words, which is comparable to the use of planes, you see. Uh, T.S. Eliot said, here I am at my age trying to learn to use words, and every attempt is a wholly new start or a different kind of failure. Because one has only learned to get the better of words for the thing one no longer wants to say, or the way in which one is no longer disposed to say it. And so each venture is a new beginning, a raid on the inarticulate, with shabby equipment always deteriorating in the general mess of imprecision of emotion, undisciplined, uh, imprecision of feeling, undisciplined squads of emotion. And what there is to conquer through strength or submission has already been discovered once, twice, or several times by men one cannot hope to emulate. But there is no competition. There is only the fight to recover what has been lost and found and lost again and again, and now under conditions that seem inauspicious. Thank you. <laughs> just seen Robert Beverly Hale's lecture number five on the shoulder girl, one of his series of ten lectures on figure drawing and artistic anatomy. We hope you'll join us for the next lecture in the series, lecture number six, which is also about the shoulder girl. This is Don Holden of the Art Students League of New York.